All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Guest Writer Series. I'm Jackie Valderrama, the Administrative Assistant helping to coordinate this series with Creative Writing Administrator Alan Borst. Today, we are so happy to be joined by Elena Passarello. For tonight's program, oh my gosh, this afternoon's program, we will begin with an introduction by Alyssa Quinn, followed by a reading slash performance by Elena Passarello. She will then engage in a conversation moderated by Professor Michael Mejia. We'll conclude with a Q&A from some select graduate students and then open it up to everyone. Please note that the Q&A function has been enabled at the bottom of your screen. Feel welcome to share any questions for Elena there. Please also know this event is being recorded and this and the other events we've recorded will also soon be up, um, uh, available and linked on our Use Guest Writers series main webpage. We encourage you to purchase books by Elena Passarella at your local bookstore, a link to purchase Animal Strike Curious Poses at King's English Bookstore here in Salt Lake City um, will be in the chat right after I finish speaking. Um, the Guest Writer Series was made possible through the University of Utah's English Department and received funding from Salt Lake County Zoo Arts and Parks Program and Utah Humanities. Utah Humanities empowers groups and individuals to improve their communities through active engagement in the humanities. This series is also supported in part by Utah Arts and Museums with funding from the State of Utah and the National Endowment for the Arts. I'd like to invite Alyssa Quinn um, to turn on her camera and mic as she introduces Elena Passarello. In the op opening of her 2017 collection, Animals Strike Curious Poses, Elena Passarello imagines a prehistoric hunter crouched in the Siberian wild. She imagines how much of his life must be spent watching animals, imagines, quote, the detail he holds inside himself after a lifetime of fiery looking. Good God, she writes, what that amount of witness must do to a human's insides. It's an apt question to open a book that is all about looking at animals. Witness, for Elena, is never passive, but rather a transfiguring force, one that disrupts the line between subject and object. In her essays, to witness is never to master, but always to open, to complicate, to foray, to mull, to dwell. Elena bears witness to the world through meticulous research, but also through imagination, speculation, poetry, and formal play. She brings together history, science, and mythology, lays many disparate things side by side, and asks us to hold them together in a single space. Through obsessive inquiry, juxtaposition, and lyric association, she invites us to make sense with her, and then to unmake it all over again. Elena Passarello is the author of two essay collections, both out with Saraband Books, Animals Strike Curious Poses about animals that humans have immortalized, and Let Me Clear My Throat, which explores the nature of the human voice. She is the recipient of a Whiting Award, a gold medal for nonfiction from the Independent Publisher Book Awards, and an Oregon Book Award. She has received fellowships from the McDowell Colony and the Hambidge Center, and currently teaches creative writing at Oregon State University. Elena studied nonfiction at the University of Pittsburgh and the Iowa Writers Workshop. She has experience in the theater and has several voiceover acting credits as well. But you won't find many biographical details like these in her work, which shies away from the personal essay in order to allow the research to take on an idiosyncratic and emotional life of its own. As she says in the 2017 interview with Tin House Magazine, research is the most magical thing. And in her hands, that is certainly the case. Elena, welcome. It's an honor to have you with us. Alyssa, thank you very much much. Um, what a beautiful introduction. Um, I, this is kind of a cliche. Uh, now when people go, I feel so seen, but I do. <laughs> I feel very seen, although now I can't see you anymore, but I know you and your cat are out there. Um, thank you for that. How, how wonderful to hear um, that somebody has considered my work so thoughtfully and has prepared uh, an introduction that is, is both so kind and so uh, Specific. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Um, I'm blushing in my own office right now. So I don't know. I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> uh, I hope everybody is doing well today. I'll put this on my uh, uh, Oh, no. Okay, so this is a this is a webinar. So I can't see everybody's faces. I just see um, my hosts 
uh, boxes. Okay, so no, no audiences to watch. That's fine. Um, I, uh, I'm an actor or I worked as an actor for a long time. So kind of just like shouting into a dark void is uh, one of my skills. So <laughs> uh, I, um, I'm so happy to be uh, reading for you today and I'm looking forward to our conversation very much. I wish uh, as originally planned that I could have been there in person. Uh, I was so excited to go to Salt Lake City. Uh, I've been to Provo twice to the university there and once to the university in Cedar City, but I've managed to drive through Utah several times and go to Moab and all this stuff and never actually make it to SLC. I've even frequented the airport more times than uh, I can probably count. And I've never gotten to see um, this beautiful city that I often drive by. Uh, so maybe one day uh, I'll be able to go check it out. I hope you guys are doing well and are having a good day. Uh, I have about 15 minutes uh, of a reading planned for you. And uh, since we are in Zoom land, I thought it would be cool to share, to do a little audio visual addition to the, um, what I would normally read. Um, this is an essay that I wrote about Mozart's Starling, uh, and it has a lot of music in it that I describe. So hopefully, if it goes according to plan, I can play you little clips. So you can kind of like listen along uh, to the sounds I describe as I describe them. Uh, I don't know how familiar everybody who's listening is with the book, but um, it's a collection uh, of essays about animals in the human mind and the way that we've sort of immortalized them over the past 30,000 years. Um, this essay is uh, probably about the end of the first third of the book. The book is chronologically arranged. So as Alyssa said, the first essay in it is uh, a story of a cave, uh, a mammoth and cave paintings. And the final one is the stor a story that broke shortly before I turned the book in, uh, maybe the year before I turned the book in about the um, dentist that uh, shot Cecil the lion. Every single animal that uh, has an essay devoted to it in the book has been named in some way, shape or form by humankind. And that was sort of the uh, organizing principle that allowed me to write a book about animals without like spazzing out because there's so much to do and so much to write about and so many different animals. Uh, I limited it to one essay per species, one animal-ish per essay and that animal that I selected had to be named. Um, yeah, so we, uh, we don't know very much about Mozart, which is very surprising to me because I feel like, especially in the 80s when I was growing up, people were always talking about him. There was this big movie that came out that everybody you know, went to go see. There was a, a not great song, but it had sort of like a Wikipedia timeline in it about him. So we learned about when he was born and when he died called Rock Me Amadeus by Falco. And um, I just assumed, and I worked in a music store growing up, and I just assumed that we had him kind of on lock. He was this genius, and we knew everything about him, but it turns out that that's not true. Um, we know very little about Mozart. Um, there wasn't a lot of record keeping in his household and among the people that uh, were privy to his music while he was making it. But one thing that we do know in um, this expense book that he only kept for like five months, he was a little bit of a spendthrift. Someone asked him to start writing down his expenses, which he did for a season. And one of the things that he wrote down was, I bought a bird, um, or he wrote bird, uh, starling bird, 37 Kreutzer, which is a unit of a monetary unit uh, in Austria at the time. And then this little staff of music uh, and then at the bottom, um, he writes, how beautiful. So what we assume is that he, he bought this bird because he got into some kind of a whistling match with it and it whistled this tune at him and he had to purchase it. Um, and we also know that he kept the bird for three years because he wrote it uh, funeral music when it died and threw a big party and invited all of his friends. And we have the literature from that party. So, um, this isn't just like a quirky little side note about Mozart. This is um, one of the largest scraps about Mozart's life and personality from which we've built the cult of personality that is his life. Um, and so I wanted to sort of live in that world. I, it seemed like a really happy place to me. A lot of these essays were sadder than I would have thought, um, which we can talk about in the Q&A. But um, yeah, I was trying to figure out exactly what what I could write about other than just that. Isn't it cool? Isn't it cool that Mozart 
bought this bird, um, which is not really, I think that's too flat of an inquiry for me uh, in terms of uh, enough to sustain an essay. And then, so I started like deeply researching starlings, deeply for me at least. And um, starlings are songbirds, which means they learn how to sing versus birds and other animals that are not vocal learners um, that uh, have their songs, that have their sounds imprinted on them like uh, cats or, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of a, a another thing that makes a sound, a goats, right? Um, the vocal learners are songbirds, maybe bats, maybe the elephants, um, and then a few species of primates, including us. And the songbird song is learned, one of the songbird song, or sorry, one of the starling songs is learned in, uh, to be sung in four parts. Uh, there's a whistle warble, a whistle section, a warble section, a click section, and a screech section. And uh, when I heard that, I was like, well, there we go. Because uh, there's also a four part system to the musical structure that Mozart used, which is sonata form. And so once I learned that, I was like, okay, here we go. Um, Mozart and this starling were both running circles around this established form to sing to each other. Um, and that, that seemed really valuable to me. So um, basically I just explained the whole essay to you. So now I don't have to read it, just kidding. Um, I will read uh, about uh, 15 minutes of, of that, maybe, maybe a little less so we can get the Q&A started. The name of the essay is the name of the animal, Vogel Star. Whistle a little Mozart to a starling in a cage. If it knows humans as creatures that sing and are sung to, the bird will shut its beak. It will arch its starling neck, bending towards your puckered lips. It might da a bob its head, dark head back and forth at the Mozart line you've sent out, the dotted pops of Papageno Papagena, or the crystalline shards of the rondo for glass harmonica. Though a caged starling is chatty during the day and downright garrulous at night, at the moment it locks in on your Mozartian whistle, the little bird will only blink aiming its entire soundless self toward the music coming from you. Note how it nods along with your tuneful body as if to say, yes, yes, I have it. But a starling is no parrot. Do not expect that when you whistle twinkle, twinkle, you'll immediately hear a little star in return. You're gonna have to come back whistling for a day or a week, confirming the sound's place in the world where the bird perches. And when it does spit back whatever Mozart you fed it, it will be on a starling's zany terms a theme from the Hoffner Symphony punctuated with guttural warbles, or the famous, famous adagio from his clarinet concerto mixed into an uncanny impersonation of your dishwasher. The Queen of the Night aria sung with a screech worthy of a bee gee. A few days after that, your line of Mozart will come to, from the birdcage as a barely recognizable string of filched sounds, all sung together in a line so arrhythmic, it's catchy. You'll hear Mozart, your own voice, the white noise of the house you live in, plus the recesses of starling intellect. It sounds a little something like this. Twinkle, bzzy, twink, hi, how are you? Dorbel, cool, checker, 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 little, burr, 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 little, cranging smoke alarm, lit, hi, how are you? Toll, twinkle, little, that BG street again, star. This will then be repeated with the maddening uh, this will then be repeated with the maddening obsessiveness of an EDM concert. And we're not sure why starlings engage in such a behavior, but we think it's because this breed is hardwired to sing to its tribes. There are many in a starling's life. The little tribe of the monogamous pair, the, that of the clutch family, the flock in the field, the mob coming home from the neighboring fields to roost together overnight, and all these tribes are sonic. And this sonic sense of the tribal might explain why, when we see a trilling mob of 10,000 starlings, each bird watching its seven closest neighbors for the slightest change of speed or angle, dodging hawks en masse with treaks and chirps, chirps and beat beats and hard whistles, we find ourselves calling that group, not a flock or a swarm or a drove, but a collective noun that's drenched in sound, a murmuration. So, what kind of murmur began that spring day in Vienna when a 28-year-old Mozart, jaunty in his garnet coat and gold-rimmed cap, strolled into a shop to whistle at a starling in a cage? That bird must have zeroed in on Mozart's mouth as the man whistled the 17-note opening phrase from his recent piano concerto 
And now I'll play the, seven, the 17 note opening phrase from the piano concerto. I hope you can hear it. I'll try one more time. Thanks, Alan. Oh, I'm glad it sounds good. Okay, so keep that in your head. Mozart's melody riffs in G on a simple line heard in many a folks leader. So the starling might have been hearing similar tunes from other shoppers that whole month. Or perhaps Mozart ha himself had been in a few times and had whistled the line long enough, long enough for the bird to learn it. But no matter how the starling got the song, on May 17th, 1784, it spat that tune right back at its tunesmith, but not without taking a few liberties first. The little songbird unslurred the quarter notes and added a dramatic fermata at the end of the first full measure. We can only guess how long it held that warbly G. At the next bar, it lengthened Mozart's staccato attack and replaced his effete grace notes with two pairs of bald crotchets. And then the starling had the audacity to sharp the two Gs of the second measure when any Viennese composer worth his wig would keep them natural and in line with the key. And those bird-born G sharps take the steady folk tune into a more harmonically complex place, ignoring the fermata natural G of the earlier measure and pushing toward the next note in the phrase, an A, which builds a lifted E major chord instead. And Mozart apparently loved this edit because he bought that bird on sight. For good measure, he drew a little treble staff in his expense book and scored the starling's tweaks under the note of his purchase. He wrote, Vogel Star, 34 Kreutzer, ba 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 And under the last measure, an acclamation scribbled in the maestro's quick hand, das war schön. That was beautiful. There is a, no other live animal purchase in Mozart's expense book and no more handwritten melodies. No additional transactions were praised as schön. This is one of the very few things we even know about his purchasing habits. He'd only begun tracking his spending that year. And by late summer, Mozart had abandoned the practice and only used his notebook to magpie random phrases of English. So this note of purchase is special among the extant scraps of his life. He also bought the bird for a at a critical point for the classical period. At the end of the 18th century, tunes were never more sparkling or more kept. Their composers obsessive over the rhetoric of sonata form, a four-part structure that permeated classical symphony, sonata, and concerto. By 1784, sonata form had imprinted itself on the listening culture enough to feel like instinct. Vienna audiences could rest comfortably in the run of classical forms as familiar and thus enjoyable narratives. And nobody played this cagey game more perfectly than Mozart. Of all the things Johann Christusom Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart brought to human sound, the most important might be his sense of surprise. His compositions, while almost always law-abiding, are full of trickery, leading tones that drop away from roots, accidentals that jar the listening mind from its diverted stupor, and minuets that are too syncopated to dance to. And these caprices, though stuck inside the pinfold of common practice, are what made him a star. As the old German saying goes, the music of Bach gave us God's word, Beethoven gave us God's fire, but Mozart's gave God's laughter to the world. He found the accidents in song that remind music to glorify the playful, the mischievous, the pop that sends Jack exploding from the box after so much measured cranking. So the starling's playful G sharp must have felt more than schön to the maestro and, much, and worth much more to him than 34 damn Kreutzer. Think of it. He'd whistled a tune steeped in Vienna's golden algebra to a thing with feathers, and then the animal bobbed its little head back and, and then whistled back to him a glorious, deviant, Mozartian wink. This wasn't just shun, this was game recognizing game. It's difficult to imagine a more priceless moment. One of the greatest thinkers in history, bonding with a bird brain. We still know very little about starling brains, really. Our scientists is just our scientists, our science is just catching up to the species complex body and behavior some 230 years after Mozart's death. Among our recent discoveries is a sturdy musical form inside one type of starling song. Though the structure allows enough variation for one starling to sound nothing like the next bird over, all courting males uh, organize their love songs into a four part sequence of whistle, warble, click, and screech. 
Each bird first begins with a set of repeated whistles, a kind of reedy introduction. Next, as the feathers at his throat seethe and puff, he weaves a run of maddening musical snippets, as few as 10 or as many as 35, curated into descending tones. Some of these snippets are filched from nearby species or lawn equipment or cellular phones. And it's here in the second movement that the twinkle twinkle meets the checker checker, the smoke alarm and the Bee Gees. Without stopping, he then slams into the third section out of the percussive click solo. Syncopated and noteless rattles shoot from his brain at, from his beak at presto speed, as many as 15 clicks per second. And then he ends with a fortissimo finale of loud exclamatory shrieks, enough to wake the neighbors. It can take him a full minute to sing through all four movements. And then the starling is silent for a moment. Some birds even bow when they're finished. Mozart's brain is as much of a mystery as a starling's. It was never autopsied, and his genetic line ended with his two surviving children. In 1801, a grave digger claimed he'd unearthed Mozart's skull, but no one has ever been able to prove it. We've simply spent the past 200 years guessing what went on in Mozart's head, and as long as we keep his 600 plus compositions in heavy rotation, we'll always have half a mind to try to figure him out. His music's heavy presence in our lives, from Twinkle Twinkle to the Requiem, keeps us guessing. But the old ideas of Mozart as a perpetual child or as a mere recipient of dictation from God have dissolved in recent years, thanks to computer studies of his autograph scores that show revision after revision scribbled onto the pages in multiple inks. We now know that Mozart drafted and woodshedded for his entire career. He didn't simply spit music out, musical ideas incubated inside of him for decades. Despite our better understanding of the scope of his efforts, it's difficult to ignore the flighty irreverence that Mozart possessed, both on and off the staff. Many have wondered why a brain that prone to perfection was so hell-bent on vandalism. Mozart loved to chatter, play, and shock. Who, for example, could imagine Bach or Beethoven jumping out of his chair in the middle of a performance, as Mozart did, and somersaulting around while the soloist committed a boring improvisation on a theme from The Marriage of Figaro? and not only interrupting that lame performance, but then meowing a counter melody over the top of it. We also see a streak in, a vulgar streak in several prank tunes, many composed in tandem with his masterpieces. There is in fact a meow duet in the Mozart Overture. Also the same year he made the luminous fantasy number one with Fugue, Mozart wrote a canon of six sober voices repeating Lech mich im Arsch or Lick me in my butt. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, I found a clip of Lick Me In My Butt, and I'm going to play it for you right now. Okay, um, and if you want to hear more, um, this is probably not suitable for a public university, but Insane Clown Posse covered Lech Mich im Arsch, uh, everybody's favorite juggaloos, uh, and Jack White played guitar. So feel free to, to like put that on your lunch break list of things to listen to. But so Mozart, while he was writing all these amazing pieces, he wrote something like that as well. <clears throat> Away from the keyboard, sorry, another, another canon from that period begins with the phrase good night, sung in several languages, then a sung fooey fooey, and a filthy line about crapping the bed. Away from the keyboard, Mozart was just as devious with wordplay, as seen in the polyglot prattle of his letters, like this one that he wrote to his cousin. Muck, muck, oh, muck, sweet word, muck, chuck, that's good too. Muck, chuck, muck, oui, charmant, muck, chuck, suck, that's what I like, muck, chuck, and suck, chuck, muck, and suck, muck. Some think that the maestro's mysterious brain was troubled by Tourette's, or at the very least an attention disorder. His own brother-in-law wondered if Mozart concealed his inner tension behind superficial frivolity by mixing the divine ideas of his music with sudden outbursts of vulgar platitudes. But this assumes, perhaps too hastily, that the vulgar didn't participate in his divine ideas. Even though we now know Mozart's brain was not God's fax machine, Many still describe it as some sort of sepulcher for only pristine sounds, but why didn't he need it all? The vulgar and the formal, the right notes and the wrong notes, and even those whispered a half, whistled a half step sharp. A man obsessed with perfect tone might need to stay on nodding terms with aberration. What if Mozart played with bad notes and uncouth lyrics, with foreign language and nonsense to hoard all the expression he could? 
just as Sternus vulgaris hoards all possible sound in order to sing. Um, and then just to find a place to close, I'm gonna skip ahead. Mozart could have kept his starling's cage in the room with his billiard table, where he often composed, or it might have stood in his bedchamber, where he stayed awake with his quill and notebook. Both man and songbird were prone to singing while the rest of the house slept. No matter the living arrangements, the bird stayed with him for 36 of the most vibrant months of his career. The maestro's forte piano was constantly being shipped from his music room out to the Mel Bruba for yet another subscription concert. Leopold Mozart complained in a letter that his son's home buzzed at all hours with rabble-rousing factions, students, rehearsal groups, goofy late-night jam sessions. Their noise was nonstop and deafening. Mozart reportedly hated being alone even when he worked. And for those three years, work he did. That costly apartment on the Dongasa saw 60 plus compositions finished in fewer than three years. The piano concerto as we still understand it was built in those rooms. The Haydn quartets premiered there, the Jupiter Symphony and Figaro. And with these heavy hitters came some of the most singable ditties in the repertoire. Melodies that two centuries of humans have since whistled could have first been volleyed between a genius and his Vogelstar. And you can bet your arch that if it were an earshot, Mozart's starling junked all of these immortal melodies. As Mozart hammered them shiny, the bird sent the tunes back upside down at half speed and double time and piped one inconsequential middle note for five straight seconds. It's not difficult to imagine Mozart valuing this kind of collaboration as he spent so much of this period reaching out to various songbirds. The starling was another musician to pump ideas into Mozart's brain, like Haydn did, or Vienna's top fiddlers, or his high soprano sister-in-law with her gobsmacking range. Among the divas, the composers, the virtuosi, that cage bird perched the furthest outside the classical box, waiting to eat all the sound it was offered and spit back strange bits with starling gusto. Picture it, an early morning composing session, the starlings, and this, this little uh, invented scene has my favorite piece of research that I un uncovered in the, um, in the, in the essay. Uh, uncovered meaning I checked out a book from the library. It wasn't like I was, you know, discovering anything. Picture an early morning composing session with the starling's cage near the 60th key. Mozart flies into the room, fresh from dressing, with his hairstylist trailing behind him. The friseur still holds the end of the maestro's wig braid like the owner of a spastic dog. The bird stirs as Mozart kicks back the bench and stands over the ebony's. He needs to tease out the theme that he's been flirting around with for days. So he finds the tonic, a sprightly G, bum, and then dances between it and the fourth below, bum, bum. Then he reverses the melody's course and skips it upward, bouncing to the dominant fifth in an arpeggio that smacks the next octave with a Mannaheim rocket exclamation point. Bum, 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 bum. Mozart can barely keep up with his pen. He's writing with one hand and playing the melody on the keys with the other. As the notes of the exposition zoom onto his staff paper, flapping along as merrily as the form intended, a jalopy fart of notes comes from the cage, countering the pristine run of the keys. Bum weep, bum bum, checker checker checker, bum 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 bum, zzz, zzz, brr, let me im arse, bah! Mozart turns to the bird, which moves closer to the front of the cage and stares. Starlings are more responsive to, the human, to human eye contact than most mammalian pets. They know when they're being watched and aren't afraid to hold a gaze. It's one of the primary traits, along with a high touch response that allows deep bonding between starlings and humans, as we love eye contact too. He opens the cage and the bird flips to his arm, screeching that same derailment, bum, 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 zeep, beep, brr, like Mickey Marsh, as it hops up his sleeve. The man sighs, keeps writing, and the bird keeps yucking and sucking and mucking it up. And now, two centuries later, not a day goes by without someone on the planet playing its result. The opening movement of the serenade number 13 for strings, often called Eine kleine Nachtmusik. Notice how, after the exposition, the serenade dips treacherously into D minor before moving forward in a new major key. All right, let me see if I can find that here. Here we go, the minor key. Mm -hmm. 
which, uh, yeah, it's as if, it sounds as if for a quick measure, a little devil has whispered something shocking into the melody's ear. Um, I'll stop there, but I just wanted to play one other sort of startling thing, but it's too far along in the essay for me to, uh, to, um, to get to it paragraph wise, but one of the starlingest things that Mozart ever composed was this kind of long uh, five movement uh, kind of parlor music uh, composition called The Musical Joke. And it's just like a lot of like goofy kind of PDQ Bach, uh, like bad, like it's like intentionally bad, like trying to make a bad song. And I love the ending of uh, the last movement because I think it sounds, I just can hear the starling just totally making this happen. Let me see if I can get to the place. It's just like 10 seconds, here we go. Oh, nope, that's a uh, Ina Kleina, here we go. I think that's uh, that's Mozart, you know, like that's not the Mozart that I was taught uh, taught about back in the day. Um, okay, well, thank you for that. We letting me in, indulging me in that weird audio visual experience. I think next time I'll hire a sound engineer to help me with the transitions. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, now I think we are. Oh, hi, Michael. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and I pop in. Uh, sorry to interrupt there. <laughs> But thank you so much, Elena. That was uh, that was really wonderful, and I appreciate the um, the musical uh, interludes as well. It was uh, you know very very helpful. I think to sort of help us sort of put us in the in the in the place, which uh, I think you do so well, obviously um, with your text as well. Um, and I just have to say, like of course we got the Bee Gees right um, in, in the essay, but I, I it just made me so happy to hear Falco remembered uh, for his masterpiece. Yeah. Um, and also PDQ Bach, which I, I rarely hear people talk about nowadays. But uh, mm -hmm. my friend and I back in the back in the back of the day were like huge PDQ Bach fans. Oh, so totally fellow nerdy. nerd! I am Yes, you. exactly. <laughs> Peter Shickley was that yes. his name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, the best, the best. <laughs> um, so I, again, I, I'm like I'm really glad that you read that essay. It's one of my favorites in the book, and. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it's so wonderful the way that you, you know, the places that you take us from a scrap in a notebook, right? And uh, this is, I think, um, one of the one of the, the great um, sort of talents that you have, uh, and then that are on display in this particular book. And I've been reading and sort of listening to a lot of your comments about research and its value and your, the pleasures of it. And I'm just sort of wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit about that, um, and maybe as well. Um, some of your, you know, sort of treasured uh, strategies for pursuing research that, you know, sort of takes us to such interesting places. Sure, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, re yeah, research for me is, I think, I think a lot, a lot of my students and myself, I think when I heard research, when I was thinking about becoming a creative person, um, it just seemed like this sort of like stack of books at the end of your desk to make sure that you had your facts straight. But um, I, 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 I've, ne I have not been able I've not been able to, it just hasn't been the case for me. I think one of the reasons is like, I was introduced to creative research in a very innocuous, uh, unchecked way, because I worked as an actor before I, be before I did anything with writing. And um, when you're acting in a, like a period piece, uh, you know, you walk in on the first day of rehearsal and the person who's the dramaturg, there's usually a board with like, magazine ads or pictures or maps um, and uh, different, whatever the period is and what it allows. And you kind of stare at it while you drink your coffee on your breaks. And then, um, you know, if you wanna be like extra good, you kind of go to the library or go to the, you know, video store or whatever. And you start kind of loosely and irresponsibly just trying to give yourself a sense of the character that you've got to play. And nobody checks those facts for you because it doesn't change the things that you say, right? The script is already written for you. It just changes the way that you embody the things that you say. 
And so I, I had permission to not feel responsible at all. But, and I really, um, I was a really underconfident actor, which is an oxymoron, but um, like one of the things that I did to help me feel like I belonged there was to overly research. And I had notebooks full of things. And I also took notes in this really loose way because there was no product. I was never gonna write anything from it. So then when I, when I realized that I, I kind of wanted to be David Sedaris when I started writing nonfiction and I realized that, that I could do this weird wormholey research stuff that I, I did with just for fun with acting and I could present it. Um, then I, I sort of already had this kind of, I already had this pro process that um, I don't, I think it was a real gift to, to have been able to have learned how to research in a way that inspired me without ever thinking that I would be held accountable for it. And now I kind of do like a slightly more responsible version of the same thing. Um, it's very shopping oriented. Um, I found an article here about Mozart and about the Starling. It's like a popular science article. It was an American scientist to think about 30 years ago about um, what they'd learned. It was, it was one of the moments where they decided that Starlings were vocal learners. It's a big deal to move a bird into the vocal learner camp. We recently got crows over there, which is, I think, super important because I think crows are the most beautiful birds in the whole history of the universe. And I keep on trying to make the crows around here be my friends. Um, I haven't, haven't won yet, but um, crows, crows learn vocally. We just couldn't hear some of the things that they were doing because they were sort of outside of our, um, the spectrum of sounds that we can process. But um, yeah, so I found this popular science article from like American scientists or popular science that kind of discussed that. And it had like a list of, it mentioned Mozart in this way to sort of illustrate it in this beautiful way. And then um, there were a list of scientific studies in the back. And then, and then I went and looked those up and found that a lot of those scientists had since written books. And then I got those books and um, just, you know, or I'd go to the library where I would find the book and there'd be a shelf of other books and I'd take them all off the shelf. And then I just set them all up in here when I'm not like, when I'm not in heavy composition, there's like paper all around the room. And I just take notes as I feel, um, you know, responsible or whatever and, and try to keep page numbers and things. And I have like a dumb system. It's all handwritten for the most part. Uh, and, um, and as I piece the essay together, you know, the, the pieces of paper get smaller and smaller or there are fewer and fewer of them in there. And then the real work happens when I have to go back at the end and check every fact. Um, sometimes I have teams to help me do that. This book I sold, or this essay I sold to uh, Virginia Quarterly Review. And we, we really had to roll up our sleeves for this one. Um, but, uh, but other ones I, I kind of either do on my own or I hire a copy editor, fact checker, or make sure I ask the publisher to, I hire somebody who's a little sharper with fact checking. So yeah, it's kind of like I eat the cake when I'm writing the essay and just sort of research in this crazy free way and um, count a lot of things as research that probably shouldn't be counted. And then in the end, I have to run the marathon to burn off all the calories that I ate when I binged the cake. <laughs> I, I, I love that the idea of, um, you know, sort of taking in things that uh, might not necessarily count as research. Um, oh. And, and um, I see Patrick Madden was here on uh, part of our, our, uh, our audience. And I think of him because, um, you know, the way in which he incorporates uh, song lyrics and, and you know, yeah. Rush, et cetera. And, and, you know, I love the sort of that interplay of, you know, the very classical essay like Montaigne and then, you know, sort of the ways in which that is sort of torqued to a, a more modern um, perspective. Is, um, is Patrick Madden like Rush? I didn't know that. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, don't tell anyone, right? Uh, okay. uh, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Uh, I have so many questions to ask you, but I'm just gonna ask you one more. Um, and I don't, and it may not be fair, or it might just be too um, bizarre. But I, I wonder if, um, as you mentioned, like several of the essays in this book are quite sad. Like, I mean, um, at least, uh, um, um, and I, I'm, I'm curious to know if you sort of came to some conclusion or some, you know, sort of develop some, some thoughts in the course of writing this book um, about what you think maybe our proper relationship to animals should be mm. at this point. And I guess I'm sort of thinking about this too because of where we are, I mean, where we are right now, like, you know, mm -hmm. unfortunately you're not here in Salt Lake, uh, et cetera, and sort of like speaking into the void as you were earlier. 
Yeah, um, I think I think I started off thinking that I was writing a book about animals, but I ended up writing a book about humans. And really, I think uh, that's probably a more responsible position to have ended up in because I know I am a human, believe it or not. And um, I think I, sh I, I can responsibly look at the way humans have interacted with animals for at least the past few centuries, if not more than that. A human might have been considered a little different before the Industrial Revolution, but um, I think I saw, you see, I think when you look at that, when you look at, you know, the, the first rhinoceros, the only rhinoceros to be on the European continent for something like 1500 years was a, a mental revolution for Western European people. Um, it broke their brain. Um, it coincided right at the same point as the printing press uh, making, making images viral and affordable. And um, it, that, that animal contributed significantly to the way in which I speak and write books, even though it was 600 years ago or 500 years ago. But that is the story of a, an animal being sort of pushed outside of its context to the point where, um, it's a miracle that it survived as long as it did. Like um, there are 9 million other sort of examples of that um, all the way up to the last full essay in the book, which is about de-extinction, which is about these things that we're talking about doing now, like um, the sort of the big visual thing is to clone the mammoth, which we can talk about more in the Q&A if you want, but um, it's, it's a ridiculous concept, um, but we have de-extincted an animal. We, uh, 20 years ago, we de-extincted a Pyrenean ibex called a bucardo, um, and we've since de-extincted um, other creatures, but very few, ver no vertebrates have lived longer than like 15 minutes. Um, but in CRISPR technology now, this, this sort of ge ge genetic editing te technology, um, we're using it to sort of figure things out with animals. Um, and the, the, the sort of only thing that I really have to think about, the, the only conclusion I think that that led me to is just that like, we have to, that we have to, cons well, okay, a, a couple of things. And I know we got to get to the Q&A. Um, one, I fell in love with a lot of animals that are going to be around no matter what. Um, I did not think that, that was going to happen when I put this book together, but the squirrels and the pigeons and the cats uh, and the and the invert the roaches they are here to stay and um, if you and the starlings of course are this amazing invasive species that aren't even supposed to be here and I derive great great joy from them and from cross fighters and I know I know that it's a terrible thing to lose so many of the species that we're losing but I, I think one one way of looking forward is to pay close attention to the context and the beauty of the the creatures that are going to be around with us another thing is if at all possible. We need to start looking at animals in the context uh, to which they deserve to be alive. So, you know, they the, this this you know this capybara wants to be friends and wear a hat is like it's. I know it's it's you know we want to attach ourselves to animals when they are mothers, when they are helpful, when they are tragic because it's when they are seem like culturally how we culturally identify the human race or the human species. So um, I think I think if we can move past that, that's when we learn things like, you know, a dolphin isn't nearly as smart as an octopus, right? Um, yeah, and I forget what the third thing was, but uh, you know, don't like don't clone a mammoth. That's the third thing that I learned because it's never going to be a mammoth, right? Like these things that we're making or remaking, there's something else. They're 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 mirrors. They're reflections of humans. They're not. They're not the creatures that we're losing. Oh, dark. Oh, darkness and dark. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's great. And I, I, I mean, I think yeah. One of one of the, the things that I, um, you know, found so lovely over and over again is that reminder of like the the unknowability of that animal's interiority and the value of having that thing, um, yeah. you know, close to us or be able to, or or be able to sort of, you know, gaze at each other and 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 and. You know, learn something from each other by not by through that not knowing. Mm -hmm. um, so we have uh, Jace written uh, is ready for a question here. So I'm going to turn it over to him. Hi, Jace. Hello, hello. Hi. Um, so I, I'm going to jump right back into animals. I mean, you know, you wrote the book, I suppose. So I don't think it's a bad topic. Um, so. <laughs> I'm I'm the I'm really glad you read the Mozart one. That was one of one of my favorites. Um, and so I'm thinking about 
in a book in which Mozart exchanges drafts and takes notes from a starling, um, or in which we read an essay um, in which uh, the, the sign vocabulary available to uh, Coco the gorilla is the sort of um, like word box from which you draw. Um, I think there's like a, a, a good humor, yes, but also kind of a sincere and, and serious engagement with, um, with something like animal language or, or maybe even uh, sort of animal emissions that we can treat as language or understand as language. Um, but also just the, the kind of most fascinating one to me is communication and collaboration between, between humans and animals. Um, and so I'm just thinking from like Descartes to uh, Berger to the scene in Moby Dick where Ahab is, is yelling at a dead whale to sort of give him answers that maybe he really wants from God. Um, yeah. that, that language is always this barrier that the animal doesn't speak back. And that's, mm -hmm. that's why they're different. That's why we're humans. That's why they're animals. And it's, it's how we define our own boundaries. It's how we define their boundaries. Um, and so I, I'm thinking about those sort of... Um, those boundaries is being thought of as, as meaningful between human and animal existence and consciousness. Um, and so I'm, I'm just interested to hear you talk about uh, how you think about animal language and consciousness um, in, in maybe those two pieces or maybe other pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and so how, and how do you view writing's uh, capacity to sort of access or communicate across those supposed boundaries? Yeah, oh, that's great. Um... It makes me think, I think it's Wittgenstein, right? Who's like, even if a lion could talk, we wouldn't be able to understand it, right? Like, it's not just the ability to verbally communicate. It's this thing that humans have sort of developed over the past 20,000 years that we now call language. It's like one way to do it, right? Like, and, 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 and the desires of these other creatures are not even to communicate the way that we would want to communicate, right? That's just a it's a, it's a wholly human concept, which is not to say that other animals don't communicate with each other and don't express, um, but human language is so specific to who humans are and what humans embody and the, the, the spectrum of what it has meant to be a human that we, I think we would be shocked uh, if, and it's, it's a, you know, it's, very, it's, it's vain to think that all you would need to do is teach that gorilla sign language and the gorilla would then be able to, you know, shoot the shit with you for a long time. <laughs> There's a lot more about, um, yeah. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that the book sort of shifted into this kind of portrait of humans is, you know, I just realized that giving a portrait of animals was kind of impossible because the interiority, I mean, it's nice to think now at least that we know that animals have interiority, but, um, I don't know, I think it's kind of beautiful to know that we can't access it. Um, I don't have a problem with that. My partner, David does. I think I really, this book and the research that I did really hurt his feelings in terms of like how much our, our pets care about us or whatever. <laughs> but um, I, I think, you know, when you think about like one of the ways to look at lyric, right, is, is lyric, the implicitness of the lyric um, it allows us to acknowledge the impasse between an interior experience and an external communication. It's not that you're trying to write through it or, or overcompensate for it or, or fill in the gaps. What you're doing through the writing is acknowledging the gaps. And that creates then an interior experience in the recipient that is its own thing, right? And then that's its own work. And I, I embrace that. I, I don't know how to try to make that happen, but I do embrace that as an effect, right, of, of lyric. And, and I, I must, my, I mean, I, I think maybe there's sort of a similar parallel to um, trying to communicate with animals and then just sort of acknowledging the barrier. And you said dead whale and Ahab, and I just have to say this really quickly. I want to get to other people's questions. I know, Amy, you have a question. So, you know, Amy, if you want to like boot up, that's fine. Um, but Jace, Today, I live in Oregon. Today is the 50th anniversary of an amazing human yelling at a dead whale event. Do you know about it? Uh, is it the exploding whale? Okay. Yes! 50 years ago today, about an hour and a half drive from here near Florence, Oregon, a dead whale beached uh, itself or it got it washed up along the shore 
And uh, in 1970, the best thing that they could think of to do uh, was to just blow it up, which they did on a news camera. And it's like my favorite YouTube clip ever. So um, happy anniversary, Exploding Whale. <laughs> Thank you for your question, Jace. I'm sorry that I answered it the way that I did. <laughs> I'm also like creeping on Jace's books. I was like trying to see what he was. Yeah, I mean, who do we have back there? Mm, okay, all right, we should move on to Amy. I'm taking up too much time with these answers. And that was such a wonderful question. I don't wanna, I don't wanna not hear other great questions. Okay, um, shifting over to my question. Um, thank you so much for that reading. Um, and it actually made me even more jazzed to ask you this particular question. Um, so as I was reading the collection, I noticed alongside a chronology of animals, it seemed to be uh, that you were writing a history of art as well. Um, and as a poet, I particularly enjoyed the Sackerson essay because I felt or like detected a lot of iambic pentameter in the sentence structure there. And I um, read the, the, the focus on I am as also a pun on I ams. So I was curious to hear you talk a little bit about that essay in particular and, and how, you know, what meter unlocked for you in that essay, mm -hmm. but then also more generally to hear about how different art forms influenced your writing style between the different essays. Yeah, oh, thank you for, thank you for that, Amy. And thank you for noticing. <laughs> I mean, you don't know, like, that's the thing with kind of being implicit about certain things. It's like, you know, like, I didn't go like, this is an I am's everybody, <laughs> film at 11, but that was hard. I am not a poet. Like, I don't know, like, I, like it hurt my brain so much. It reminded me of the one time when I was in theater that I played a guy, or there were several times, but when I would play a man, especially a man who lived in another period, it would change the way I walked. So I would like always be standing out and like all this body work that I did, trying to think about the world in lines of five I am's. When I tried to compose the next essay, it was like, <laughs> I had to like, kind of like get it out of my head. Um, for that one, I, I, I don't, in general for art, like, I think I like writing about art. I think it's just kind of the thing that I like to do. It's what I did in, uh, uh, in my first book too, writing about art in different mediums, not just visual art. And I think it really, it was conducive to the project just because, you know, almost every single art form, the first thing that we did was try to engage with animals, right? Like the, the German pipes, which people think are now the oldest found musical instruments. I'm sure there will be other ones. Um, that have been unearthed. Um, they, they, you know, people think that they were made to mimic the calls of birds. Um, before we made tools, we sculpted uh, animals. You know, we the Chauvet Caves are thirty thousand years old, and there are these beautiful depictions of animals running and of the, the different ways that the light might hit them gives them this great motion. So, I think it was really conducive to um, the project, and also, you know, like. I, I just really believe in even people who don't make art seem to want to be artful about animals, right? Like it just seems looking at animals seems very like a very common thing and also making art about animals, telling stories with animals, you know, finding ways to draw animals just seemed very, um, very almost, I mean, universal is a very scary term, but it, it seemed, it seemed to be um, inescapable. Uh, even people who don't give a crap about art, like they love those YouTube videos of like, you know, like a turtle writing on the back of, or a frog writing on the back of a snake, you know, I think that it's just, uh, yeah, I think that's just a part of it. Does that answer your question? Can I? Uh... Yeah, I guess the, the kind of the other part of it was if your writing style, I mean, certainly yeah. your oh. writing style kind of replicates the different art forms. Sometimes it does, sometimes it's nice because it's like, oh, well, this art, this art form is going to ask me to meet it halfway. And so then I, I have to, then I have like a, 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 dic a request, a dictation of how, how to build the essay, you know, because the essay, the blank page is so scary um, and it could go anywhere, but sometimes the art form will dictate something about sound. For the, for the Sackerson piece, I didn't want to glorify this bear was a champion, but he was a champion in this world that compromised him. But that's my 21st century brain also looking at him because I don't even know what a person was 
in 1600. And so I had to, I had to sort of like, I, I wanted to sort of avoid being a tisky 21st century person, but I also didn't want to glorify this basically like cockfighting kind of thing, you know? Um, so I thought I could use the language of the only other person I really know from that time period, my buddy, William Shakespeare, and um, tell the story in that meter to kind of push it away from my ability to sort of like converse openly about it, to push, to put this distance um, so that everything we were experiencing was filtered through this kind of disengagement, you know? Um, and then another example would be the, the, the Christopher Smart essay on the cat. Jeffrey, I, I learned that that, you know, English language's most famous cat poem was missing its left-hand side. When we read it, we're really reading the right-hand side of the page. For I will consider my cat Jeffrey, for he is the very soul of gravity and waggery. And if we look at the rest of the Jubilate Año, the big book from which the cat poem is excerpted, there's a let, it's, it's antiphonal. There's a let line for every four. So um, let me rejoice in the lamb for I am the Jubilate Año. So then I had this wonderful dictation to try to finish the poem. Um, and so that was another example of like a hard level of guidance. Other times, um, other times it's, not as, it's not as easily dictated, I guess is another way to say it. I never knew that about the Christopher Smart poem, so thank you. <laughs> I didn't know either until I started researching um, the uh, Jeffrey, and I I've loved Jeffrey for fifteen years, and I I called my or I emailed the person on faculty here who deals with that period, who then put me in touch with um, the most famous scholar of Christopher Smart that he could find, just to confirm it, um, because it just seemed so um, so perfect, like. Uh, like it's just so so wonderful and and the other thing that I recently learned because they just put out a book about Jeffrey uh, Oliver Sodden S-O-D-E-N is that there's such a hard break in between the kind of last line of Jeffrey for he can creep um, and then what starts next is I think talking about bulls or something it just kind of moves on to something very very different there might be more, many more pages of Jeffrey material that we it's just you know it's Sappho right like <laughs> we just don't know but I'll never, I mean, there's no better line for me than for he can creep. Like, that's just a beautiful ending. Anyway, um, thanks for your question, Amy. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> These are great. And you guys are also good at Zoom. Like, uh, like uh, another, yes, I'm, I'm happy to keep talking. I know we're over time, but I, um, I think I was a little gabby. So if, uh, I'm happy to give you as much time as you need, Michael. Um, I think Max is coming. No worries. We got Max next. Am I good to go? Hi. So uh, my question is about process. And um, so reading the book, it's interesting. It's, it's episodic. Um, each is a unique you know, story about an animal. Um, but reading it, uh, you feel that actually the whole book really coheres. And you still feel a sense of sort of like mm -hmm. overarching structure surrounding some problems that, you, that you've already talked about. The naming of animals, the anthropomorphization, the... Uh, mythologizing of animals and then where that leads to, like you said, de-extinction and all these other sort of contemporary things. So <clears throat> my question is about like how, at what point in the process, process did that structure uh, like cohere? Because mm -hmm. as you said before, you were just so absorbed in the research and then you had a sort of rule about had to have a name, had to have one, one animal per chapter. How did that whole like kind of narrative in a sense cohere and what did that cause you to leave out or th those sure. kind of things? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, thank you, Max. I uh, so both of the books that I've written, I've I've noticed I've noticed some things that kind of are similar, and I think I'm kind of like I don't think this is a word. It's probably pretentious to say this, but like I think I'm a collectionist. Like I think I I think I think of a I'm not a chapter writer. I think I like to write in these what you call episodic moments. I like to set each one up like a role, you know, that I play and sort of live in but I don't wanna do that for too long. I think I really enjoy the idea that, uh, you know, if I can just stay in this world for four months and do it right, I can abandon it. <laughs> but I think that the thing that I really enjoy is to do that 16 times and then put all those things under some kind of an awning in which they mean something more together, right? Like a concept album, you know? 
Um, and one thing that I've noticed is I can't write a check for that at the beginning of the process. I have a big animals, the voice, and then I try to write one essay or I've already written one essay. And then I, that I think I'm like, oh, this was very sustaining. And then I pull out some of the aspects of the subject, not of my writing, but of the subject matter. And then I try to find another subject matter that shares similar properties. So after I wrote the first version of the Sackerson essay, um, long, long time ago, I was like, I, I felt better about doing this than I usually feel about writing. I think one of the things that really drew me to it was the fact that Sackerson had a name and that um, he was this sort of compromised figure, but like Shakespeare didn't name check Marlowe. He just sort of like alludes to him. And Shakespeare doesn't name check the other, the children's company who were doing these kind of like Bugsy Malone uh, productions that were taking away from his ticket sales. But Sackerson gets a name, his, his name is now uttered by humans centuries upon centuries and generations upon generations of humans, that just grilled my cheese. So I tried to find another animal that was named and remembered. And I wrote another essay like that. Maybe I did about three. And then I take stock again and I look at sort of similar properties, which sort of allows me to set the next kind of thing of parameters. And then um, I think that the ordering part happened after I was about halfway through it became really clear to me that this needed to be chronological because like I said, you know, this became about people. And so then it was like, oh, if this is a map of a consciousness, then um, it would be kind of interesting to show that consciousness as it grows and changes, which I think maybe even negatively affected the book because some of the heaviest, weirdest pieces happen quite early. So if you're reading the book straight through and, you know, like, you know, you've got other things to do, you might be like, Ugh, where like the really like magazine-y pieces happen a little further in. Um, but then the last thing that happens, or there are bunches of things that happens is um, you start becoming aware of then what all these things have in common in a negative way. So um, all of these animals were so sad and they were ending up dead on the floor. So I was Googling like happy animal or, um, they were all fuzzy quadrupeds. I think I did the bear, I did a dog, which I got rid of and some other four-legged thing. So then I started looking for birds and bugs. Um, you know, uh, everything was sort of like in this world of kind of uh, 18 something to 19 something. So then I had to look, you know, so just to fill out the, the, the respect the form. And then um, the coolest thing about making collections, I think is that then the collection starts ordering you around. So one of the very last things I wrote was uh, the only essay that's in the first person because there was no way that I could get away with kind of incriminating all of these generations worth of people without incriminating myself. So then I, I had this like shopping list. I had to find an animal that was alive when I was alive that I interacted with in this way that would prove this, you know? So it was almost like um, being puppeted by the collection by the time it was over. Whereas in the very beginning, it was kind of like, what is the one thing that will keep you, will, that could put a second essay in place? Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And I'm glad you mentioned the things you left out because I was kind of curious, as you mentioned it being a collector, there must be like at least a half dozen interesting animals that were like maybe not quite enough for an essay or like like oh I have to cut the Fiona the hippo I've got you know yeah. oh yeah. Fiona yeah she was born afterward but like she was the yeah. year that my and then everybody kept on calling me it's the only time I was in the style section of the New York Times is because they were like oh she wrote a book about animals that was reviewed last week let's call her but here's the thing writers of America um I have a lot of cutting room floor animals that I just wasn't able to extend uh Geronimo the parachuting Beaver, uh, uh, Zarafa, the giraffe that was walked from Marseille to Paris and caused a fashion rage. Tony, the uh, silent film movie star horse. When you get a book out and once the pub, you know, you, you turn the book in, whatever, a year before your pub date, they ask for these little intern pieces of internet content, basically, uh, that you can write to kind of keep the buzz going right around your pub date. And every single one of those, except for the dog, I think I found a place for. So if you are putting something together and you have a bunch of stuff on the cutting room floor, hold on to it because you can, there's a, there's a moment where you, they're gonna want you to be pitching something 
everywhere and then you lo and behold and then those things will probably get like more attention than the actual book and you'll be kind of like how did that happen <laughs> like but um but yeah uh yeah it was a happy happy change michael is going to read the last question typed up and then i'll jump on okay great Thank you, Max. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks everybody for those great questions. And um, again, thanks so much, Elena, for your answers. Um, so we've got a question here from Jacob Yorty and uh, he says, uh, among notions of cruelty and power in the human animal relationship, I wonder about a resultant uh, reading from the elephant electricity essay. In it, human ingenuity electricity is quickly turned into an object of interest or entertainment and at the same time, a vehicle for punishment. In the context of the ways that species gain favor over another, would you consider this a somewhat expected symptom of a world where physical capability often uh, chooses the victor, or rather indicative of humankind's particular ability to inflict cruelty or subjugation in an admittedly chaotic world? Ah! Is this a PhD program? <laughs> it is, isn't it? Oh no. I only have an MFA. I shouldn't be. <laughs> um, okay. Well, um, thank you for that question, Jacob. I am not worthy of it. Um, I don't know. I don't know about the humans. What we're more. What it is more indicative of. But I will tell you this. Um, I had a hard time writing about just directly about cruelty in a way that made me, in a way that was declarative or, um, and I read all, all of the, you know, the, the theorists that I could understand who wrote about cruelty, Foucault and, and Fanon and whatnot. And I, I, um, I never felt like I could do, I could make any statements, but th so then I found this story, this, and I, and I, I also knew that I really didn't want to write about elephants because I was so, I'm so convinced that we just need to get out of their way and never go anywhere near them again, unless it is to, you know, find some way to help them thrive because they are so complexly designed and very little of what we have done um, has enhanced that. But then I started learning that, you know, elephants have been in this country you know, since, since it was like a very early colony, like really, really early or late in the 1600s. And um, it is strangely, even though elephants are not native to North America, has been a part of the American language system the entire time in this way that I think is really interesting, right? The Republican, the, uh, the elephant and the donkey um, seeing the elephant. So I think but I wasn't gonna write about the elephant at all until, um, until I found this story, right? There's the famously electrocuted elephant Topsy, which I can't even bring myself to watch. I mean, I have, and then there's the most famous circus elephant Jumbo. But then you have this elephant who was electrocuted and lived and who was named Jumbo too, but didn't cause nearly the, um, the sensation that Jumbo one did and he was electrocuted at a fair where a president was assassinated and his assassin was electrocuted before the fair was over. In the town, one of the towns that was first electrified that also um, where a lot of the, uh, the first experiments about um, death by electrocution began. So what I thought I could do with this is just show how, how much of a mess in my brain the idea of being cruel to an animal and the idea of being cruel to a human and the idea of showcasing American progress actually was. So uh, I found, you know, I found this like t this newsletter that was, you know, 60,000 words long, um, a news report twice a day from when they broke ground on this World's Fair in Buffalo to when um, it concluded, maybe even a few months after it concluded. And it really felt like this kind of like police blotter kind of timeline. And so I adopted that style um, and sort of researched outward and tried to bring it together in this way that the only kind of um, commentary I could make was in the curation of what came where. And even that was subject to temporal restraints, right? Um, 
And then I just wanted to, I just wanted people to see, I don't know what the plural of nexus is, but all those nexuses, <laughs> nexuses. Uh, and, and that was really the limit of my critical ability, I think. Um, and that's probably one of the reasons why answering your question is difficult for me. Um, I think, I think the furthest that I could go was get these realities. I knew that we had been cruel to elephants. I had known that circuses existed. I had known that people had shot uh, world leaders, and I had known that we had electrocuted those people. And I had known that America, you know, was sort of known for uh, it's one of the few places that uh, electrocuted people um, as punishment. Um, so I wanted to. I knew all of those things my whole life, but then at like 36 years old, I, I, I saw the way that they kind of ran into each other in this way that also creates this really amazing picture of the Gilded Age. And so I thought like, like the, I mean, that was as far as I could go. Um, I'm sorry that I can't directly answer that question. If, if we were live and together, I would, we would have had a back and forth and maybe you could have helped me get somewhere with that, but I hope that that helped enough. Hi, Alan. Hello, Elena. How are you? Uh, I'm good. Thank you for it. Terrific. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you so much for extending the Q&A a few extra minutes. I know we had you up early this morning, meeting with some of our nearby Clemente High School students in the Salt Lake area. They were great. Efforts there. Uh, on behalf of the University of Utah Creative Writing Program and all in attendance this afternoon, I offer you a very hearty thank you again. Uh, what an enjoyable afternoon. So much fun. Uh, many thanks also to our other participants, including Michael Mejia, Jackie Valderrama, Alyssa Quinn, as well as Amy, Max, Jace, and Jacob for their questions. Um, this is our final event of the fall semester, but rest assured we've got a terrific lineup of events and works for the spring. So we'll be announcing those dates and times in the coming weeks. Uh, please stay tuned. I'm sorry that we're not in person to give you the, the hearty applause that you deserve. Uh, but thank you so much again, Elena. It's been great to spend some time with you today. Oh, it was such a pleasure. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Thank you, Alan. Um, I hope you guys uh, have a lovely rest of your November and good luck with your studies. And hopefully our paths will cross at AWP or something uh, when the world is different. Please don't be strangers, everybody. Um, I'd love to hear more about you and your work uh, if ever the occasion should arise. And we'd love to see you in Salt Lake at some point when, uh, you know, it's safe. <laughs> yes, I want to do that. Yeah. yeah, for sure. We'll make that happen. Absolutely. Oh, good. good, good, good. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks again, again, Elena. Thank take you, care, everyone. Please take care. Thank you. Uh, cheers. Everybody stay safe.